You know, once again, you guys just remind me that the only stories that matter are the ones you live. Because <laughs> uh, you can hear an expert tell you these things all day. doesn't matter. But you got to hear yourself saying them. Uh, it's just amazing work today. Um, so my my work in progress, my... My response to the price action that I just heard. <laughs> so, uh, you know, Ernie, I, Ernie I, I want you to think about um, excavating an open pit mine and spiral path up a mountain. You just keep excavating, right? It's almost like if when you put those two things together, here's a moment of Zen. You got to be very careful about how you just progressively excavate that mine. You got to go to the next spot and dig when you're ready. You can only go to where you're ready to dig. So you got to dig. And you look over there, there's somebody else going way, way deep in their mine. And you think, man, I should be going deep. Yeah, but you can't go deep in the mine until you get there. So just do the things you got to do to get there. So you start excavating that mine, unpacking carefully because you got to watch out for you know, the collapsing walls and that. Um, where are you going to put the dirt? Well, you're building the mountain. You guys are all building the mountain that you are climbing. It, the mountain is in your head. The mountain is in your work. So as you pull that stuff out of your depths and you just pile it somewhere, put that into intentionally, don't get rid of the dirt, build the wall, the dike, the dam, the fire break, the perimeter, uh, the the uh, topsoil that you're going to use to grow crops, or you're actually building a mountain that's going to allow you to climb up so you can see far with wisdom. And you're going to climb that mountain in little spirals. It's a deliberate process. It's like, or, or a pyramid. Same thing. So connect those two. And just say, where, wherever I am is where I'm doing the work. And there's wherever you are, there's work to be done. And when you feel like you need to be doing a particular kind of work, go to the place where that work gets done. And you've got all of those places in your ecosystem of trading to do, right? And you got to visit all of those things. you got to go pull the weeds. you got to go plow the field. you got to let that field lie fallow. you got to... Feed the hogs, as Norm MacDonald would say. Uh, for Ken and all of you, I, I would try this if you want. Take this script on the zero state in the lesson and just record it in your own voice until you're satisfied that you got the flavor of it right or pieces of the script. And then... Once you have that, and it's good enough for you, and you know exactly what I mean by that, or you should, listen to that every day for a week before you trade. And at the end of the session, when you give gratitude and forgiveness, listen to that thing and say, did I do that thing? So bookshelf the trading activity with that intentional statement about the zero state and don't judge it or anything. Just, just listen to it and then let it go and see what that does for you after a week or two weeks, probably two weeks, but I'd start with a week, but you got to do the work of recording it in your own voice and get over your fussiness. Oh, that wasn't good. Okay. Keep going until it's good enough. Just, you already know what it's got to sound like to be good enough doesn't have to be perfect. It just doesn't have to be embarrassing. And you're the only one listening to it anyway. So what part of you is going to be embarrassed at listening to your own voice? That's the voice you'd be talking to. Because I'll tell you what. Let's put, let's put a little spotlight on the voice that's giving us all our inner critiques. Hey, you're, you're so good at pointing out all my flaws and the things that I'm trying to do and I'm trying to learn. Let's record your self-talk 
and play that out in public and see how well that stands up. That's what the essence of the owl meditation is, by the way. You just record all just record all of it. Every piece and enjoy every piece of negative self talk and self despisement, all of that stuff. Just write out the words and just feel who you are. And then on the other side of it, just record all the emotions that you feel when you hear yourself that critical. Just put one word emotions on that. Put that on two sides of a five by eight card. Put that card in an envelope when you're done with all that self-loathing. Just put it, light it on fire and watch the smoke and just and sit there until there's the next thing to do. Just, so that's one way, self-talk. Now I want you to record, just try this thought experiment. Record that speech on the zero state in your own voice. When you're satisfied with it, then listen to it before and after each session for a week and just see what that intention does for you. It'll just, you'll just get over all the, the all the bullshit of the self-talk. Get past that. Or what's the value to you of dwelling in that place? Oh, well, I don't have to actually go do hard work because I can just beat myself up a little bit and just enjoy the pain and suffering and stay in that. Let you get out of there. Uh, the voice of the zero state in that speech is your home crowd. You're going out on the field and that crowd is there and it makes a difference. You listen to every athlete at the professional level where every mistake they make is magnified forever on YouTube. Look at this when he got hit in the head with the ball. The home team loves you and wants you to win, and they're cheering for you no matter what. They want to see you competing. That's all. All a, a genuine fan wants is I want to see my team fighting for us for the boys, for the city. So record that zero state speech with that in mind. Next, that little uh, flash card, that vertical blue line is the pulse of time. It's like an EKG. That thing is just pushing Every guy with the plan and money and worry and fear is just get, that wall of reality is just pushing them into the next bar and they're stumbling around just like everybody else. Now, uh, does your plan account for how everybody who's also in the market is making decisions based on their fear and greed? Is that how good your plan is? Does that how good your plan has to be before you can trade? Or just know that there's a million, a billion other traders out there stumbling around making fear and greed decisions. And I love Jeff's quote, fear keeps me from doing what I should. Greed makes me do what I shouldn't. So who else do you think has that challenge? Everybody else in the market. They just don't know it or what to do about it. That's why they stay in that space. So that big vertical blue line of the current moment, the mindful moment, is where you are. So that was a perfect description of that uh, of that template and then fused with the standard framing questions to interpret it. Dude, that's the best five minutes on the internet. Uh, losing a soccer match seven to zero is still, it's just a one hour loss. Ten Hagen knows that. He already knows going into every game what it's going to feel like when they lose as the manager of Man United. But he, you know how bad that feels with Sir Alec walk, watching you at Old Trafford? He, he's getting paid to take that loss so that other people don't have to own it. That's what he does. That's what the manager does. So... 
He's willing to take it. He says, I, I'm not afraid. To, I've lost soccer games before. A 7 to nil loss is a one-hour loss. So what are you going to do about it is the only thing that actually matters. So that's what he did. He said, all right, well, we've come a long way, but we can still get beat 7 to nil by a team that's having a tough season too. So what are we going to do about it? Let's go to work. Let's go. So 7-0, seven, seven it's a one-hour loss. Uh, I want you to think about, relative to your question, um, there is a room in which you do intraday trading, and there is a room in which you do swing trading. And on that wall, there's flashcards and art and hanging. And there is a door warden who's going to interrogate you every time you propose to go between the two rooms. What's the password? You know, why, three-minute trader, do you think you should go into the other room with that trade? Hey, 30-minute trader, why do you think you need to go into the three-minute trade with that trade? Just answer that question to that interrogator. And he's got, it's like crossing the border. Every time, you know, they're going to look, uh, let me see your papers. And then you're sitting on the rest area when you're out of the trade and you're, am I going to go to the three minute or to the 30 minute? You still got to cross the border. So have your papers in order and know why you're going in between. Think of that model. So developing the coaching eye, why that's so hard but so important. It, I hope it's hard because that means that nobody else will do it or enough people are not going to do it that we have an edge if we do it. So I hope it's hard. It's hard. Take a look at that soccer training video I posted on Patreon, 13 minutes of um, giving advice to my coaches on how to look at the game. Maybe 10% or 5% of the comments were about what the kid with the ball was doing. Everything else was about where should the rest of the team be positioned. Uh, because there's 22 people, there's 23 people on the field, one of them at most has the ball. So the team that plays better without the ball is the team that always wins, minus the rounding error the messy effect. Uh, so about 90% of the comments I put in there were about how to look at the game without the ball. And then a few cases, I, I actually had to go back and put a few more in there to praise the kids with the ball so that they could see that it, you know they're part of the game too. But developing the coaching eye for yourself is even harder than coaching others because you are simultaneously in the fishbowl and outside of the fishbowl, but never at the same time. So that's that makes it a little easier. Uh, so yeah, you got to figure out how to feel the feelings that you were in, or you just say, look, it actually doesn't matter what the feelings were, because that's going to be so variable. I actually don't have to worry about it. As long as I have a standard way to manage the emotions that I feel, if I always just do the same thing, then it's not hard tracking all the feelings because you will have disassociated feelings with actions. So rather than do all that hard work of trying to catalog all the feelings and then associate certain feelings with it, fuck it, leave all that alone. Drop it like a wing tank. Use the energy of the emotions like a wing tank for a P-47 in World War II so that they could escort the bombers over Berlin before the P-51 came in. And when you go into the fight, you don't need the emotions. You drop the wing tanks, but you got a full load of fuel on, and now you're ready to fight. I'll take a P-47 all day. That aircraft had zero wing malfunctions in the entire war and outperformed at altitude 
and was the combat infantryman's best friend. The Jug. I'll take a P-47 all day. Love the P-51. Beautiful aircraft. Give me a P-47 and we're going to win. Uh, I'm going to send you the link to Greg's Automobiles and Airplanes where he does the tech analysis of all, I mean every, World War II aircraft. He's a pilot. You'll enjoy that one, Greg. All the data that you want. Uh, so developing the coaching eye, part of that confidence that comes when you're good at it is you now know, hey, I'm actually free to just trade the way I'm going to trade because my coaching eye is recording everything and I'll think about it when it's time to think about it. So you can just move that body of work to later because you're recording everything on the flight recorder. And now all I got to do is fly the airplane, make the trade, dig the hole. So developing the trusted coach's eye for yourself means that you can stop worrying about thinking about what the answer to the question in your head is. Well, what if I did, what should I do? No, you don't have to worry about any of that stuff because you're going to think about that not under pressure of the trade, but that's what assessment means. That's what the assessment means, is that you've moved that to the time when you're supposed to do that, which is when you're not executing. That's when you're assessing. Don't cross the wires. Uh, I wish everybody had Chun Lung's problem. My job as a teacher and a coach is to try to give everybody Chun Lung's problems. Here's Chun Long's problems. Man, I've got this system that gives me a lot of trades reliably with a single pattern that has a very good winning rate and every 20 trades, no matter what, is positive. But it feels hard. Yeah. Yeah, it's supposed to. Uh, and it never feels right when I'm in it. Yeah, so now you know you're in the right spot. How many traders want to be able to say that? Uh, all of them. So quit whining about it and realize that the what think about the connection between an acorn and an oak tree. The market is giving you acorn after acorn of small, reliable, ours and then all you can see is the oak tree that you can't carry back to your little squirrel hut yeah but it's giving you acorns go plant those acorns in another field so that you can grow all the oak trees you want to generate more acorns in the future but you got to go get the acorns the only issue really now is when you have that reliable system to generate R, don't change any of that architecture. None of, don't change any of the framing or the geometry. The variable you change is the dollars at risk per trade. If I could get a quarter of an R on every trade with a 60% win rate, I'll trade it 10 times a day for two and a half R. How, how much does that R have to be to meet my financial objectives? So don't lose sight of the performance characteristics of that system. Now there's other systems maybe we can look at to get bigger parts of the move or other parts of the move or how many of those were just re-entry issues that just reliably capturing a quarter how much can you carry anyway it's the dollars at risk per trade not your total maximum efficiency you know efficiency at capturing the whole move is one interesting well i actually would like to have less efficiency not more efficiency because that tells me there's an awful lot more gold in the mine Feeling the 1R loss, 
is like a vitamin that the more you take, the better you get. Uh, because any exit better than a one-hour loss is a win. What about, how good does that feel? I, I've already felt the one-hour loss. I can handle that. I got a thick skin. I'm a rhino. Uh, yeah, need to spend more time on that. The feeling the one hour loss instantly. Feeling the one hour loss before you even put the trade on. And you say, nevertheless, I'm going to put the trade on. I know that as soon as I put this chip down, I'm already going to feel the one hour loss. Think of the joyful anticipation of that. And then do it anyway. It's good for you. Take your goddamn medicine. You know, eat your corn. Eat your spinach. Yeah, creativity begets creativity. Uh, I also look at it, you know, from, you know, the motto of the French Foreign Legion, march or die. Uh, okay. They, they, let, they just put that to, the sergeant doesn't have a lot of time to persuade you about anything. It's just, they're in a tough spot. They know it. They signed up for it. And the, that's the motto of the Legion, march or die. And you decide. Yeah, creativity works in both ways. You know, when you aren't doing the work to get more creative, you should be accumulating anxiety about saying, man, where is that spark? You need to have that spark all the time so that you know the engine is running and it's warmed up and ready to go. So when you hit the afterburner, it's ready to go because it's already running and idling along. I don't have the startup cost. That's why we leave the, the diesel engine running all the time. It's just cheaper, but you also know that it's working. Um, so when you come home and you take off that armor metaphorically and hang it up, you can do that because your, your home is your armor, right? So draw the picture of what that safe space is, your base camp. And that sanctuary and all the things that you do in there, that's that you'll see this in the house of trading visualization that we do in the foundations and in here somewhere. We're, we're going to do that here. So that's where you're preparing in a safe space to do the work that you, that you got to do in your, you have a training room, a ready room, a library, a meditation room, the community room, your rest area, your entertainment center, the equipment room, the film room, that and then you cross that threshold to go down the hall of champions out onto the playing field. Uh, so draw when we get to that, let's start thinking about what that metaphor is. You don't have to do it right now, but that we're going to ask you at some point to draw that. But that's Safety, trust, truth, transformation. I'm thinking about the guy that I trained with that had the, he got his black belt faster than anybody. He came in as a white belt, and what he did every lesson, every session uh, during Randori, which is free play, I throw you, we throw, you throw me, bow, next. Uh he would go to every black belt, throw and be thrown, bow, go to that, and just go from black belt to black belt, just getting thrown, 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 trying his best, doing his thing, learning from each speed run. One, you know, one minute throw, speed run. And he, for 60 minutes, he'd get thrown a hundred times and throw a hundred times. And then you realize that uh, when you're throwing a guy, it's the same as doing a break fall when you're being thrown. It's the same body motion. Like if I'm going to do a standing shoulder roll, I relax and exhale and I bend forward and I just put my body into an arc and I like a wagon wheel. So it hits the back of my wrist, forearm, upper arm, across my shoulders. Exhale as I hit the ground and then land on my feet ready to go. 
That's a break fall. That's how you fall without getting hurt. A shoulder throw is nothing more than getting into a guy's space, loading him up on you, and then do a shoulder roll with him on your back. And you land on top of him like a bag of wet sand. And that's the end of him. You know? Uh, so that one-minute training, finding those limits, total immersion therapy. You afraid of snakes? Handle a, a million snakes safely. Right, just go handle snakes. Start with a picture of a snake, then a rubber snake, then safe snake, baby snakes, then safe snakes. Decide where you're going to stop on the progression to handling rattlesnakes. Don't handle rattlesnakes. Leave the snakes alone, but don't get over the fear of them. Be alert when you're walking through the field. Uh, you could wear uh, uh, Teflon gaiters if you're in rattlesnake country. Don't get bit by snakes. They give you every chance to get the hell away. Except pythons in the Everglades, I th it seems that they're coming after you. Hey, so I get paid to be wrong a lot for discovery learning. I get paid to be wrong, finding all the things that don't work. I know why they don't work, and I know all I have to do to make it work by finding that limit. So I get paid to, I get paid to be wrong a lot, and sometimes I make money. Uh, there are three buckets in the histogram of your results when you're working on the data. Bucket number one, the most important bucket is no losses worse than minus one. That's one bucket. When you look in that bucket, it should be empty. That's what I'm looking for is nothing. Bucket number two is the space between minus one and plus two. That bucket when you pull that bucket out and dump it out, it should have positive expectancy. That's all. I don't care if it takes a thousand trades or, you know, that bucket should have positive expectancy. That's how you take care of business. Bucket number three are the trades greater than two are. I'd like to have something in that bucket. Those are your three standards. If you do those, if you have those three buckets, then you have a sustainable growing system. Nothing in bucket one, positive expectancy in bucket two, something in bucket three. The ratio does not matter. The bucket is the bucket. And there's different activities that you take with each bucket. If there's something in bucket one, stop that. you, you got to break down in your rule somewhere. Uh, if you look at the swing trading on 30 minutes, every time I make a decision to hold overnight, I, I'm get, I, had a, I got some things in bucket one. I just have to eat that cost of doing business. That's the difference between being perfect and making money. I just know that I'm going to have something. My intention is to have nothing in that bucket. So when I take that risk, it's with full knowledge. At, on that system, what I got to do is take a look at bucket one and bucket three. Does bucket three pay for bucket one? Yeah, done. Done in one. So remember those three buckets. Uh, using willpower to do the right thing is what wears you out because that's an active verb. I have to make so many decisions in order to commit my willpower to do something. It's exhausting. Unthinking action is the easiest. So now what I got to do is convert correct intentional action to unthinking action so that I'm not thinking in the trade. And that's what the flight simulator will do for you. 
is it allows you to do routine things routinely. And your monitor, your manager, your flight supervisor, your flight plan keeps you on that part of the flight path where you can, where it's just routine things routinely by knowing where those layers of boundaries are and stay out of the bad weather. Don't fly through a thunderstorm unless you have to. Yeah, not only does the market not care about your plan, it can't because it doesn't even think about you at all because that's not what it does. The market is pure execution. You know, and that's one way to get over the feel. you know, other people's feel. you're worried about what they think about you. Dude, they don't think about you at all, <laughs> if we're being honest. <laughs> hey, so I was, uh, uh, I'm in some hybrid course university where I'm, we're learning, learning how to do hybrid courses and I'm participating in there. And so some gal asked for help. She said, hey. She's, she's looking at uh, public speaking and she's trying to do a feelings inventory about what kind of feelings have people had in the past and the present associated with public speaking, you know, fear, excitement or whatever. And what did you do about it? So I, I answered her questionnaire and then she was very grateful. And she sent me a note back and said, if you don't mind, uh, what have you done with those feelings? And do you, were they from the past or the present? What, what did you do about them to fix them or overcome those feelings? And so my note back to her instantly was uh, all of those feelings that I listed are past, present, and future. I don't try to get over them or eliminate them. Instead, I move towards them and embrace them with gratitude. I just use the energy and the information they contain to give me the energy to do my life's purposeful work. Done in one. That's my emotional state management. That's how much I worry about the emotions. I move towards them, embrace them, feel them, use the energy for my life work. I mean, is there anything else you could even do about them? I don't think so. Oh, well, I suppose you could change human nature and your entire bio emotional cognitive wiring let me know how that goes just embrace them feel them move on use your brain to establish the boundaries use your gut to help you understand where those emotionally charged boundaries are and then use your flight simulator to refine purposeful action routine and do routine things routinely so you can bring home the bacon so you can bring home wheelbarrows full of acorns. You're going to eat some acorns. You're going to make acorn pie, and you're going to plant some acorns to grow more oak trees. You know, we just did our taxes yesterday, and the uh, state of Kansas does not uh, tax my military retirement. And so uh, I get a healthy refund every year from the state of Kansas. Uh, on my taxes, I think it was like uh, two grand. And so I just convert the two grand of Kansas state tax refund into all their little state sponsored charities. Like they have the chickadee check off the meals for wheels for seniors and support the arts and all that. And I just, you know, preserve the wildlife, whatever. So whatever, I, I figure that's just my relationship with the state of Kansas. Hey, you don't you don't tax my military retirement. I want to live here. And to show my gratitude, Kansas, all the money that you saved me by not taxing my military retirement, I'm just going to give to you to do all the other good things and good decisions you make, like Meals on Wheels and all that stuff, so. Uh, I just have to hide that number sometimes from my wife because she's, <laughs> I better not put that on the recording because she squeezes every nickel. But I will not tolerate any discussion on that point. <laughs> uh, so 
that's my that's my relationship with the state of Kansas. So, in that above my shoulder there, you see the mill house there, the mill and grinding. That mill, the whole village put together and lifted the millstone up there, and it grinds all of the grain, all of the acorns into meal or whatever. That grinds the grain, and uh, and it's right next to that unending water supply, the limitless water supply coming down from the mountains. Some goes into the cistern, some is agri, you know, flooding the fields. Some of that water evaporates to go back up into the mountains for rain and snow. The water cycle, you know, but you gotta, you gotta, you gotta do something to grind. 